Welcome to the Fly Culture Podcast, bringing you interviews, reviews, and fishing tips. Here's your host, Pete Tigers. Welcome back, everyone, to the Fly Culture Podcast. My guest today is a fly angler, tire, and author. I'm looking forward to hearing about the fish he targets locally, some tying tips, and a whole lot more. I'd like to welcome the feather mechanic, Gordon van der Spey, to the podcast. Gordon, it's great to have you along. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. Can't complain. I'm pleased to hear that. And are you getting out fishing? I haven't been fishing lately. We, we're just coming out of winter and we're about to go into spring. And then our streams, will, our streams have actually opened, but no one's been out yet because it's still freezing gold so yeah i can see you sitting there talking to me in a quilted jacket and stuff like that and for listeners because obviously they're going to be a little bit confused thinking well you're coming into spring do you want to tell us where you're based well i'm based in south africa uh, you all know where that is probably based on the rugby alone um so i'm based in south africa and i and i live in a place called gordon's bay and it's in the Western Cape of South Africa. And I'm surrounded by vineyards, mountains, and streams, and the sea. And yeah, so that's where I'm based. And does that mean you've got a great mix of fishing right on your doorstep, by the sound of it? I've got a trout stream 10 minutes away from us in the doggy park. That's the closest trout stream. And do you head there to go and get your fishing fix or are there other species that you like to go to or is it those tumbling mountain streams that you really enjoy? So so what we've predominantly got close to me is trout, rainbow trout, um, and, and a lot of indigenous species as well. But like the Doggy Park isn't really a serious fishing venue, but it is the kind of place that you can go to and fish for half an hour and make a couple of cars, catch a fish or two, and, you know, that's great. You don't always want to make a whole day mission. Sometimes you just want to have a cast with you, and and so it's great for that. It's very uh, temperamental, and it's difficult to fish, and you're competing with dogs. I once had a Labrador land on the head of an 18-inch fish I was stalking. So that kind of thing happens there. Um, so it's not a serious fishing venue. Uh, if I want serious fishing, I need to move about half an hour away from me, and then I then I get into wonderful small stream fishing, like crystal clear water, big round boulders, uh, sight fishing. It's basically, I would imagine, similar to New Zealand, but just everything's on a smaller scale. Smaller streams, smaller fish, smaller everything. We even fish. I mean, the, the, the whole way you fish for these fish is very light. You're fishing seven extra birds. You're fishing one weights, two weights, naught weights, uh, long leaders, um, small flies, 18s, 20s, 22s. It's, it's that kind of fishing. That sounds my dream sort of fishing, I have to say. And you mentioned um, about stalking a fish and you mentioned about the clarity of the water. So does that mean that you're actually targeting individual fish rather than fishing to the water? Yes. I've always, look, obviously sometimes you fish blind, also depending on the lighting conditions and so forth. But mostly I like, I like looking for a fish, summing that fish up and then fishing to that fish. And then that's just something I like doing, you know. Um, so my preference, personally, if I can fish to a single fish with a, either a dry or a nymph, that's great. I like seeing the fish and seeing what it's doing and, you know, and, and reading the fish. I, I just like that. And does that mean that you're getting heavy sort of hatches um, and as a result of that rising fish or just for listeners here really so that we can get a sense of what the fishing is like where you are, are you sort of following hatches or uh, do you have fish that will more likely sort of come up if it looks like some food rather than being locked onto a specific hatch? Okay, so our fish predominantly are very opportunistic. We, we do have hatches, but we don't have – our hatches aren't regular and, and they're patchy at the best of times. 
we don't have like on the streams I fish, we've got little net veined midges, we've got micro caddis, we've got uh, small little mayflies, olives, blacks. We don't get big may well, the biggest mayfly we get is about a size 12, but most of our stuff where I live is small 18s, 20s, 22s. Um, you don't need to carry a massive fly box, you can fish the whole day with six flies. You know, if they don't work, then almost nothing's going to work. And that's, that's the, it's, it's very simple fishing. You know, it's not, it's, it's not complicated. What, and most of the time there isn't a hatch. Most of the time fish are just feeding opportunistically, you know. Um, so, so yeah, so it's, so it's that kind of fishing. You walk up the stream, you, you look for a fish, you see it holding there. And, and then you fished it. But, but if, before you fished it, you first just watch it. You know, I think too many people just start fishing. You look at what the fish is doing. Is he nymphing? Is he rising for the odd emerger? Is he, what's that fish doing? And then after you've done that, you, you fished it and you, you catch it. And I, I'm guessing terrestrials would be part of the menu there then on that basis, will they? Terrestrials? Early season, we fish terrestrials. And, and then, funny enough, we fish large as well, like hoppers. Um, at the end of August, beginning of September, what happens on our streams is hoppers will typically commit suicide because there's this little worm that sort of lives inside the hopper and he eats the hopper from the inside out. And hoppers, when they're in excruciating pain, will just jump into the river and trout will then eat these hoppers. So early season, you can fish like a size 10, size 8 hopper, no problem, and fish will willingly come up. But fish that same hopper three months later, they won't even look at it. So yeah. It's funny that, isn't it, how fish can be locked onto something. And I've noticed at home that the mayfly, the big ephemera danicas, that the fish will gorge themselves on them and the hatch may continue, but they will suddenly switch off. Do you think that's just they've had enough of that thing at the buffet and that they've had their fill or and, 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 and they just can't eat anymore? What, what do you think about that? Well, I think fish are a lot like us. You know, if, you, if I give you a massive fillet steak that's three kilograms big and you eat it, you're not going to want more. And I, and I also think fish are like us in terms of – you know, the narrative we've been fed, well, at least I've been fed my whole life, is that when it comes to trout fishing, you ideally want to be imitating a specific food form and fish will eat your fly because it's a food form. And, you know, nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, think about this. Do you eat marshmallows? Occasionally, yeah. So so what is a marshmallow? What does it consist of? Like what, what food type is a marshmallow? Yeah, it's like you, you you can't really tell. You know, it's a sweet. It's got sugar in it, and but and in the same way, fish will just eat things in the drift, but even if they don't know what they are. You know, that's why you catch fish on all this, all these mop things and all these weird things because they're not always feeding on, on 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 naturals. You know, they they testing things out. They're like kids. If you give if a little kid will put something in its mouth to taste, is this good? Is this not good? You know, they'll use they'll use tape to identify what it is, and if it's not good, they'll spit it out. And they'll put anything in their mouth. I used to eat sand when I was a kid. I don't know why, but yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good, very pertinent point. And yeah, I was circling round to ask you that question. Say, so, well, do you think they just put stuff in their mouth just to see what it is? It's the only way they can find out because they obviously can't pick it up. So. Um, very interesting from that point of view. And also it resonated with me what you said about light lines, because I guess that's a function of the water, the clarity of the water that you're fishing, that you prefer those lighter lines. And again, myself and I'm sure many people listening are light line enthusiasts. And I remember when they first started to come onto the market and people thought they were just sort of a Toys the wrong word, but a high days and holiday rob. But they're perfectly serviceable and perfectly usable on 365 days of the year, aren't they? Yes. Look, form follows function. So whatever you 
you fish with, as long as it's motivated, that's fine. And if you think about it, um, obviously, if I was fishing to a massive uh, seven-pound fish, you know, I, I probably wouldn't put on nine x tippet and and use my one weight there, like in some bigger stream with big with you know stronger currents and that sort of thing. But in these tiny little streams that you can basically jump over in most places, I mean, you've got to match the tackle to the situation. Context is everything in fishing. It's 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 everything. So and and I like it. I like this miniature fishing. It's it's fun. I like your style very much. Um, interestingly, and I'm getting a sense of you already, uh, how you look at things and how you analyse things. And we're going to come on to your books a little bit later. Um, but you said at the beginning that we seem to live in a world of instant gratification. Do you mean that in a, a fishing sense as well? I mean that in an everything sense. People... People want things to be easy and to be quick. Uh, they don't want to think too hard about them. It just needs to be instant. And, and, and that's the case with fishing too. I mean, go, go do yourself a favor. Tie, tie a nice fly and go put it on Facebook. And the first question that you'll get is pattern, please. As if the pattern is the only thing or the main thing that determines the success of the pattern. It, it, it doesn't. Patterns don't catch fish. Flies that perform optimally do. And it's kind of like we, we've moved away from that. You know, if you look at a lot of the tying videos, they're very monkey see, monkey do. Everyone's telling you what to do, but not everyone's telling you why you should be doing it and explaining the, the logic behind it. You know, Fly fishing is very scientific. It's like a, a decent mix between science and art. And, and, and most of it's quite logical. I mean, why do fish sit on the bottom of a stream? Because it's easy to hold there. Why? Because the currents isn't as strong there. Why? Because there's resistance. You've got rocks and boulders and all these things, and they slow it down. So it's easy. And that's all a logical thing. You know, um, if you talk about sink rates, uh, what what affects a sink rate? Well, resistance affects sink rates. That's why light tippets. You don't. You're not just fishing a light tippet or a, a tippet with a very thin diameter because it's fashionable. You're doing it for a reason because it it offers less resistance on the sink, so it cuts through quicker. You're fishing in the zone for for longer. You know. So a lot of this stuff is very logical, but people aren't asking themselves those questions very often. They they cut and paste in terms of the way they approach their fishing, you know. And, yeah, uh, it's, if you think about this, it's, it's it's fun. It's fun to figure these things out. Yeah, I, I, I'm absolutely with you on that. And I think we've changed. It may be, you know, I'm going to bat social media, but I'm not because I think it's probably internet. And I, I, I was thinking about when people may have conversed with each other let's say an angler in the uk and an angler in new zealand for example both fishing or let's say south africa even that are fishing very clear water similar sort of backgrounds but they had to a figure it out and i've often said on here that people would often either write an article about it or write a book about it and learn a little bit more but also sharing ideas wasn't as quick so it may have taken a letter from Angler A in the UK to Angler B in New Zealand to say, I've been noticing this, how about that? And then that correspondence starts and then the germ of an idea comes together about the behaviour of the fish, a hatch, a fly, whatever that may be. And it seems to me now that these things can happen, like you say, instantaneously and the ability to learn out on the river can or the still water whatever it may be is sometimes replaced by what well, i can find out quickly by asking that question and my classic example of that is recommend me a rod well you know what i might like and what you might like it sounds as though we like similar things funnily enough um 
but they are different things, aren't they? And do you think that is a function yeah. of the internet making that so much easier to tap into a world very, very quickly? Well, I think it makes it easier, but sometimes I think it inhibits you from having a, a learning process. And I think a process is an important thing. Um, it's it's kind of, a, I don't know if you've got, if you've got a UK's Got Talent or Pop Idols or, or that sort of thing. What you'll tend to find is they, they make these instant stars of children, right, of people. They come up, they sing, they become this instant star. But being a star isn't just about your ability to do something. It's about your understanding of the thing. And if you haven't had a process, staying there is a lot more difficult. It's easy to become a star nowadays because, you know, you can uh, you go on some program, voters love you, and off you go, you get a record deal in there. But we all know that there's no substitute for experience, and that's actually the thing that's lacking. Everyone's reading everything, and it's very theoretical and it makes sense to them. But you've actually got to do it. It's a bit like learning to swim with by book. You know, it's not it's not it's not the optimal thing. You've actually got to get in the water and actually do it. And and that's why you'll see like like good anglers and good fly ties are intuitive. They they're asking questions, but they're also they sort of connected to the environment they find themselves in. It's not you you can be clever and you can uh, read a lot of books and you can have book knowledge, but let let me put you on a stream and see what you can really do. You know, because everyone can talk a good fish, but can they actually fish? You know, and sometimes you'll be surprised. I, I won't mention names, but I've fished with people who are like world famous, and then I look at the person fishing and I go. Mm, I don't know. Like, you know, like, is the height maybe bigger than, is the sizzle bigger than the steak? I don't know. Um, and, you know, fishing's never been about that for me. I'm not a, I'm not a great fisherman. I'll admit it. I don't fish enough. Like, I'm, I've got friends who are fantastic fishermen. I'm not one of them. I don't fish to prove that I can fish. I fish because I love fishing, you know. I don't need to catch five million fish. I once did it, well, not catch five million fish, but a friend of mine taught me how to urinate. And he, he said to me, I, I, I just want you to do this for, for, for one day. I want you to go urinate and, and come back and tell me what you think of it. But I want you to really concentrate and I want you to catch as many fish as you can. And I went out and in an afternoon I caught 77 fish. These were yellow fish. I caught 77 fish. And he said, what did you think of it? I said, you know what? I actually didn't like it. He's like, what? How can you not like that? I'm like, because it became about numbers and not the experience. All these fish sort of melted into each other. I couldn't even remember individual fish, you know. It, it, I, I became like a machine. It was mechanical fishing. And then the next day I went out and I was still with the urinal, but I did it slightly differently. I looked for specific fish. I remember a hen fish. I found in a, a big granite basin. And I, I put on a small little nip with a, like a 2.5 mil bead. And I, I just put that in, and she just moved to the left, and poof, and I hooked her. And that to me was cool, seeing that single fish on the nymph. But this story of where they where they're like hundreds of fish lined up, and you're just nymphing through them, and you're just picking fish of every cast, uh, you know, it's it's cool and all, but... For me personally, that's that doesn't excite me. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm with you. Funnily enough, I I bought a rod um, the other day, and I just wanted to try it out. And it's quite clever. It's called the Witchwood Drift XL, and I bought it for like ninety quid, and I wanted to try it and see what it was like. And you can twist it, and it makes a nine and a half foot four weight, or it's actually a three weight, but I put a four weight line on it. It makes it a ten foot six nymphing rod. And mm -hmm. I set it up very quickly and I was fishing with my friend John who designs the magazine and it was fun to do. But I, I think many people are kind of like what you're saying that, you know, and th there is the argument and I know somebody kicked me in the backside once and rightly so that they said, look, I don't get to fish as much as you do. So on those three or four times a, a year I fish, I want to fill my boots. So I get that. 
side of it as well. And if that fulfills that, that's fair enough by me. I have no problems with that. But I think, and and like you say, that you live close to a trout stream and or close to a number of trout streams, which is wonderful, so that you get that chance to um, fish, to ex- experiment, to enjoy, experience and everything else. So it makes it easier to sort of snip off. And I'm very often, I don't know if you're the same, that I'm very often, I've caught a nice fish or that one that I was targeting, I'll snip snip off and go home. It, I'm sensing you may be similar in that as well, will you? Yeah, you know, I. if you look at the way I fish it, everything is very, very simple. I, I, I don't even have a fly fishing vest or anything like that. I've got a thing called a moon bag. It's basically a pouch that you can put around your waist and in this pouch, I've got a small fly box with a couple of nymphs and a couple of dries, maybe a terrestrial or two. I've got a spool of 7x tippet, 6x tippet. I've got a... Uh, that's your dog. Yeah, he oh, is. Cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, he's cool. Um, and, and and maybe a little bit of muslin, uh, sinkant, maybe a bit of a uh, power float. And that's it. I, I really don't have much, you know. It's it's you you don't. I think we overcomplicate it sometimes. I think we've got all this stuff, and and and, and you walk onto the stream and you, you you feel like a Michelin man, you know. I like to be light. I like to travel easy. I don't want too much stuff. If I want to swim across a stream, I want to be able, you know, if I get to a deeper section or whatever, I want to be able to do it. I don't want to feel I can't do it. So, so, so my whole approach is is very simple, I'm not, and I'm not saying that's the only approach to follow, by all means. But that's why I can go fish for half an hour. It doesn't. There's no prep time, you know. I've got the rod in the boot of the car, the, the little pouch is there. I can be driving anywhere and go. Mm, I wonder if there's a fish in there, and fish, you know, just fish it. And you'll find fish in the strangest places, let me tell you. I don't know if the UK is like that, but in South Africa, I've found fish in the weirdest places. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, And and that is that sort of experience side of things, isn't it? That spending time on the water rather than asking the popular masses, find out where these fish may hang out. It may not be where um, preconceived ideas or conceptions may actually be. I wanted to come back to the flies. And very often people, I ask this question nearly all the time and nearly, if this isn't the 200th, close to it. And I ask people, do they carry many flies and the answer is often no. Do you think there is a comfort, though, in carrying a lot of flies? Do you think that's why, as anglers, we are prone to do that? I think we're prone to do that because we think, and we've got this idea, that the fly is the most important thing. And if one fly doesn't work, then we automatically think another fly will. And I, there are times when the fly does matter, like I've definitely had times where I'll have a little bit of purple in a nymph and whenever I put the purple nymph on, a fish will eat it. And if I don't have a purple nymph on, the fish won't eat it. So there are times when the fly does count, make no mistake. But very often the your sort of entry level requirement is the fact that you present the fly optimally. Um, you can have the coolest nymph on earth, but if a fish doesn't get to see it, you're not in business. So presentation needs to be sorted out first before everything else. Uh, and, and you've got to get the fly to the fish. The fly has to get to the fish. It's got to be designed to do that. Uh, and when you start understanding that, I think carrying a million flies doesn't become the most important thing. Yeah, I like that. That's something we talk about a lot on here. It doesn't matter what the pattern is. If you can't get it to the fish, you're not in the game. So um, I like that very, very much, what you're saying there. Um, We touched on tackle very briefly, and I watched a video on YouTube of you fishing. Do you fish a bit of bamboo, did I see? I love bamboo. Uh, I've got friends who are bamboo builders who build bamboo rods, and... I'm basically friends with almost every bamboo builder in South Africa. And 
and I get to fish their rods. And I actually have a rod from our, well, he died two years ago, but our oldest bamboo rod builder was a guy named Sage Potgieter. And this guy started building rods, I think, in the early 80s. And you couldn't really get Tonkin in South Africa. It was difficult. So he would build bamboo rods out of local cane that he found in South Africa. And I've actually got one of those rods that's not built out of Tonkin. It's built with what, what they call, um, what do they call it? It's, it's, it's this cane that grows on the side of the road in the northern part of our country, in the like warmer, uh, more tropical area near the Kruger Park, Hazy View Cane, he called it. Uh, monkey cane, I think he called it. And what he would also do is, eventually when he did get Tonkin cane, to conserve his Tonkin stocks, he would make rods with both the local and Tonkin cane by alternating the strips. So he would save his Tonkin. But our local cane is a lot, it's a lot softer than Tonkin, you know, so you get a, a slower rod. And when he died, he actually left me a rod. I interviewed him the one day and he left me this rod. And I think his son thought I would just put it in a frame. And the first thing I did was I went to go fish that rod and I fished it hard. I was, I was in Lesotho on a, a two week trip and I fished that rod so hard. I mean, it had a slight bend in it by the time I was done with it because it had, it had you know, I fished it hard. And I said to him, I said, Gerard, you know what? The mistake we all make is we put these things in frames. He's, the way we honor a builder is to fish his rod hard because that's what these things are built to do. You know, they're made to fish. And, and yeah, and I, I, I just love that. And I also think people have a misconception when it comes to cane, you know, because ultimately what ends up happening is the first time you cast a cane rod, it's generally some friend of yours's grandfather's rod and it's some form of a hardy or whatever the case might be. And it's an old rod and it's as soft as spaghetti. You know, it's like waving around. And then you cast this thing and you think, yes, if this is cane, you can keep it because this thing's crap. But, but it's, like, it's like kissing a girl for the first time and it's bad. And then you go, I'm never going to kiss again. You. you can't have that approach to it. Because how are you going to know if you haven't done it a couple of times, you know? So what you do is you start fishing bamboo rods and fishing different bamboo rods from different people. And then you start realizing, ah, oh, bamboo is a very varied thing. I mean, you can have fast bamboo rods. You can catch tarpon on bamboo rods nowadays. People are doing it, you know? You can have soft bamboo rods. You can have medium action depending on how you build the rod, how you design it, you know. Um, yeah, so I, I think bamboo is a lot of fun, and there's something quite cool in, in owning a bamboo rod. It's it's just a, it's a cool thing. Yeah, nice, nice, I like that. And I was, interestingly, I was reading, I dip into a fishing forum every now and again, and there was an interesting thread that's quite pertinent to the conversation we've, just having now about bamboo rods and somebody asked the question do you think using bamboo rods um is something that you use when you're getting a little bit older which i found fascinating personally i started using in my late 20s early 30s you're certainly substantially younger than me and so it isn't just an age thing, is it? It's the aesthetic, it's the pleasure, it's the organic feel and everything that goes with it. And and like you say, that it isn't, you're not going to be casting a noodle, are you? No, 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 no. It, it's, you've, you've got to try rods out and makers, makers prefer different things. So they make the rods the way they like them. But when you cast enough rods, you realize, oh, okay, this guy prefers a faster rod. This guy likes a noodle. This guy, you know, and but the really good makers understand tapers so well that they can do whatever they want to do. They can make it fast. They can make it slow. They can make it medium. They can, they, they can play because 
because they're not just they they're not just doing a they're not just mechanically building a rod. They are designing a rod to have a specific feel, to have a specific aesthetic appeal, to have a you know I I personally like simplicity. So I've got a friend Stephen Bossop who builds rods, and what I like about the way he does them is he he builds them simply. There's not too much crap on a rod, you know. When people start engraving ferals and like, that might be cool, but like, why? You know, from a fishing aspect, like, why do that? You know, weight's also an important thing. Um, you don't want too much weight on the rod. So, so like, uh, bamboo ferals or graphite ferals are cool on, on bamboo rods. Uh, you don't want these big brass ferals, like, affect the action negatively. It might be traditional, but why not use what we know now and marry that into the traditional and enhance it? People tend to think that things stand still. They think of bamboo, the development of bamboo rods, bamboo was developed and it, it was what it was. But it never stopped. People continued. It's the same thing with classic fly tying. You know, we still tie classic flies to this day. And we've got better threads. We've got, you know, the modern things that help us. Um, sure, understand the tradition. But don't be afraid to let modern things help you out. Why not? Yeah, very fair point. We're going to move on to your book shortly. I, again, I'm getting a, a lovely sense of you as a person as well. And away from... Um, fishing uh what else do you like to do what is a, a, another hobby that or pastime that you're really into that gets perhaps close to fly fishing for you okay so so i like i like doing anything that's creative i love drawing as a little kid i used to draw the whole time and I, to this day i draw a sketch like i was sketching this morning before uh, before we started chatting, I was, I was sketching uh, what a damselfly nymph, I think. Uh, I love that. I'm an actor by trade, so I act. I do a lot of voiceover work. Uh, nowadays, I do a lot of dubbing work. You get these Turkish TV series that they, they dub over into a language in our country called Afrikaans. It's basically, it's, it's Dutch. It's basically Dutch. And uh, they import these programs. And then we need to dub them over into Afrikaans. So I do a lot of that. Uh, and I've been an actor for 20 years. But as an actor, you, you can't just act. You have to do other stuff. Because it's such a volatile industry and business. So I've always fished. And tide flies commercially, I don't do it anymore. So I'm just saying it right now. Don't ask me to do it. But... When I started acting, I tied flies commercially and I'd teach people to tie and I would, you know, do all this stuff. I, I, I ran South Africa's uh, largest fly fishing expo at one stage, basically the South African version of the BFFI. I started that and, you know, and I write. I write for magazines. Um, I love walking. I, love, I, I live around mountains. So, so walking up mountains is a flipping cool thing to do. You know, I don't know. It's just cool. It's as cool as fishing. You know, so I've actually sometimes, and that's the cool thing about where I live, you can combine the two. You can walk and fish. So you're walking, you're looking at the flowers, you're looking at the birds, the sunbirds. The, 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 it's, it's just cool to see things, you know, just, just to look at things in nature and see how they are. The one day I, I was fishing a, a small stream near my house and there was a, a boom slung, a very poisonous snake, just sitting there. And I just watched him for like 20 minutes. Snake and I were eyeing each other out. It was cool. I thought it was cool. Nice. Nice. Looks like you've got yourself and your life pretty much sorted. And, and uh, yeah, I like where you're, you're coming from. Uh, now, we're going to move on to the books. Um, I want to start, as I always do, I always try and be as transparent um, as I possibly can, that Gordon has not 
asked to be on here. I asked him along. He's not paid. There's been no promotional thing. Um, I'm just fascinated yeah. about the books and want to learn a little bit more. So tell us about the Feather Mechanic books, please. Okay, so the first book started by accident. I never, ever intended on writing a book. It was something that was never planned. Uh, I was sitting on Facebook the one day, and someone asked me a question. And the best way I could explain it was to draw a little diagram for them. So I drew this picture, and I, and I showed them how it worked, and I basically posted it. And someone said to me, yes, if you... If you did a book like this, I, I'd definitely read it because this made so much sense to me. And I didn't give it much thought. And I, people asked me, can you draw me a little picture and explain how this works? And I started doing that. And eventually, after about six months of doing this, more and more people were saying, I was getting emails, please write a book and put the drawings in me. We want the drawings. And I said to my wife, I'll never forget it. That morning I said, I'm going to write a book. She says, but you know nothing about books. I'm like, why, why do I need to know anything? I'm going to write it. And on Facebook, I put a note and I said, guys, I've been listening to you guys. I'm going to now write a book. You can put your orders in right now. I can't tell you when this book's going to be finished. I've never written a book before. I don't have a publisher. I don't know what to do. But put your names down. And when I've got a book, I'll let you know. And Within half an hour, I had 50 names down for people who wanted to buy my first book. And it took me another two years after that to get it all together. And, yeah, the Feather Mechanic 1 was born. And the whole idea behind the book is the, the first book was a philosophy of fly time. It's hin it hinges on the whole idea of form follows function. Figure out what the fly needs to do and tie it to do that. It's a very simple uh, idea. It's basically like the wheel. If you look at the wheel of a car or just a wheel, why does it work so well? Because, because of its design. It basically promotes continual movement because in, there's no break in the line. It's a continual line. It just goes and goes and goes. And that's a great example of form following function. But you can apply that to anything, actually, not just fly fishing and fly tying. You can apply that whole thing to your life. Does this work for me now? No. Why not? Because of this. Is, so why am I still doing this? Ah, huh. okay, cool. Yeah, that makes a hell of a lot of sense. And I like, it's almost... I don't know if this is the right term, but it's almost Zen-like in that sense. And and certainly in the, the second book, and I suspect the first one as well, that you have the way that you structure the chapters is a, a lovely way. And, and perhaps you could tell us a little bit about it, certainly from what I've seen in the the second book. I don't know if the first one is the same, but it's not sort of, you know, I think you cut – call one of the sections tying from the soul i think it was and how you describe those flies as a result perhaps you could tell lis listeners a little bit about that okay so the second book uh the first book introduces the whole idea of form following function the second book basically delves into detail into small things and and it's based it's basically divided into three sections it's divided into the workhorse flies it's divided into traditional flies and tr divided into soul flies. Now, I know, I know I said that form follows function and all, but the reason we fly fish is not just to catch fish. You know, I'll, I'll tell you why I say that. Because if your only goal was to catch fish, you could take a hand grenade, uh, pull the pin, and throw it into your closest stream, and that would be highly effective. But you don't do that. Why? Because how you catch the fish is important to you. And whether you like it or not, when you're fishing, and fly fishing in particular, you've decided that how you catch the fish is important to you. Because if it wasn't, you could just use a spinning rod or whatever the case might be. So it's not just about catching fish. It's about how we do it. 
that's why sometimes people will fish it dry, even though they've gotten most of the fish on the bottom, because they want the fish on the dry. We all know if I put in a nymph, I'm going to catch them and catch a lot of them. If you want to do it in the way you want to do it. So, so, so basically, yeah. So the first book, uh, the, the first, the first section in the book is about workhorse flies and that's basics. And the second section is about the traditional flies. And, you know, a lot of traditional flies are frowned upon nowadays. People look at them as relics of the past. But if you look at the way life is, life is a very cyclic thing, you know. It, it just repeats itself the whole time. Uh, I, I saw a, a video the other day on YouTube, and it was about this American guy where he was fishing a nymph on the point and a, a dry on the top, and he was basically uh, dapping with the fly in the drift. And he was hammering fish on this. And this guy was so excited and he made it sound like he'd, you know, like rediscovered America or something. But the idea of dapping a fly is not new at all. You know, the idea of fishing a fly like that in the drift is not new at all. Wet fly fishermen have been doing it for hundreds of years. Um, and we, we tend to forget like, like you look at you look at Euro nymphing and you think it's a modern thing, but a lot of the ideas they are not modern at all. You know, people have been fishing like that forever. They just didn't have a name for it. They just weren't calling it Euro nymphing. Um, so a lot of the stuff is is the same old same old thing that's just happening over and over again. And the reason I like the whole traditional fly thing is because. You have to understand the fundamentals to be able to do them and to pull them off. Anyone can tie a purdy on or tie a quick little hairs here or tie a or whatever. And it's cool and all. You don't need much more than that. You can fish your whole life just with those flies and you're going to catch lots of fish. But you're not going to know everything or, 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 or know all of it. Okay, you never know all of it. But it's a bit like going on an advanced driver's course. You, know, you don't need to do it, but once you do it, then it affects normal driving too. You just you're not the same driver. And traditionals are like that. Then you get the soul flies, you know. The soul flies you just enjoy fishing and tying. They just they resonate with you. And for me, tying is is such an important part of fishing. You know, it's it's not just about fishing, it's a it starts at the vice. And that idea grows there and it evolves there and you take it to the water and you refine it there and you go back to the vice and it, there's a journey that's involved in it, you know. It's not just about a tie a fly, catch a fish and that's that, it's done. That's why, like, there's this one fly that was my nemesis, the no hackle done. Go Google the no hackle done on on you know on Google, and you'll notice that probably ninety nine percent of the people who tie these things can't tie them properly. Why? Because you've got to figure it out. There are nuances involved in that fly. You know, people go, "Oh, yeah, but you don't need a nacre done to catch fish." You, no, you don't. You can catch fish in another way. But sometimes it's just cool to catch a fish on a no nacre done, and they are highly effective. They are like deadly. You know. And they're not hard to tie if you understand a couple of things. I mean, they're all about, and no have for done for me personally, it's all about thread tension and placement at the appropriate times and in the appropriate places. Once you figure that out, they're not that difficult to tie. I mean, Renee Harrop, is, he doesn't have superhuman abilities as a fly tire. He just understands what's required for that specific fly. I would say like a no hackle would probably be probably be one of these soul flies. You know? Those patterns that you just love. And we all have them, you know. They are. That's nicely put. And again, I'm getting this sense of you as the challenge or the a challenge of a fly is part of that journey to learn to tie it properly, to fish it. And then you 
would I be right in thinking, right, okay, you've got that one. What's the next challenge? And you move on to the next challenge to look at that, having learned from that previous thing. You're always looking to learn. And you rightly said, this is something we never get fully on top of and never learn everything. But you're trying along your path to take as much as you possibly can from it. Would that be right? Yes. You People think that they learn a craft and then they are proficient at that craft. But what I realized was, and with this particular book, is I started writing this book and I I was conversing with tires every day. And I picked up all these nuances, things I didn't think about, you know. And even though when I started writing it, I was a very experienced tire, but I realized, hell, there is so much that I don't know, you know, small things, like tiny things. and. One of the guys I worked with on the book was a guy named Wayne Llewellyn. He's an American tire. He's probably one of the most proficient, efficient, and logical tires I've ever met. I mean, if you if you want a method to tie a split tail, Wayne will give you 27 methods, and he'll explain each one, and he'll tell you why he'll use a specific method over another method. There's, there's nothing... There's nothing really, I don't like to think of things as being wrong and right, but there are things that are more effective and more efficient than other things. And understanding that is quite important. And me being able to, I mean, this book was basically documents my two-year journey with these tires. And I mean, it wasn't just the case of me asking them, okay, guys, write me a chapter. It was like, Write me a chapter, and then I'm like, but why do you say that? You said this and this, yeah, like, explain it to me. I don't quite understand it. Or when you tie the fly, you do that. Why, why do you do that? You know, I'd, I'd rather do it like that. And you say, no, no, he does it like that because of this, 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 this. I'm like, okay. Like Marcelo Morales, for instance, is this Argentinian tire. He ties a matuka in the book, and he, he, he has basically like jungle cock sides in this thing. His way of tying in jungle cock size is so clever, and it's something I never thought of. What he'll do is he'll cut the JC nail to the correct length. He'll then put a little bit of super glue on the base of that, the V, and he'll, he'll basically create a flat spot, and he'll tie the nail in on the flat spot. In that way, the barbs don't move, and, and, and the, the nail doesn't roll it doesn't roll because you're tying it in on a flat spot i mean i would have never thought of that i've I've done it in a different way but when he told me this i'm like oh that's so obvious you know it's obvious but it's something i never thought of and while i was working with these tires a lot of the stuff you know kept creeping up i was like wow but that's so obvious and most of the stuff's obvious you read this book it's stuck you go why didn't i think of that that's obvious but it's like another thing, like um, have you ever fished something called the Comparadon? Mm, absolutely. Okay, now what happens is traditionally people tie in the hair for the wing and then they basically pop the hair back and they have this ball of dubbing in front of the wing and that's supposed to keep it propped up. But you go fish a Comparadon, you'll see what happens if you do that. The hair will lean forward. It's like the the tension or the pressure that that dubbing puts on the head. Basically, once that fly gets wet, something happens and it doesn't work anymore. So what Wayne does is he will divide that clump of hair into smaller clumps and he'll work thread through it. And that will basically provide the wing with internal structure. So there's stuff inside the wing keeping little bits of the wing propped up. So it's not just dependent on this one ball of dubbing. You've but, and Davy McPhail does it too. I saw him tie a, a comparadon type thing too. He, he, he has an interesting, uh, he, he dubs as well. So he's got little bits of dubbing coming out of the, the, the wing. It's quite cool. Uh, so, I mean, that's something I'd never thought of, you know. I never thought of giving the wing internal structure. I thought, wow, that's brilliant. Then I spoke to Jay Lee who ties a humpy. And before he does the, you know, separates the wings of the humpy, he does the same thing. I was like, Oh, this is amazing. 
I said, so Jay, you probably do it to make sure that the wings are upright, you, to give them internal structure. He says, yeah, it's exactly why I do it. So there are all these small, tiny little things that, I mean, you don't have to know all this stuff, but it's so cool knowing it, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And that's given us a nice insight into the book that there is lots of really interesting hints and tips that you may not have seen before. Um, for listeners, the second uh, Feather Mechanic book, um, Gordon has, as he's alluded to, a bunch of really, really good fly ties in there. Jay Lee and Barry Old Clark, who are both friends of the podcast and have appeared. And I know Jay is synonymous with the Humpy and I know how much he, he likes that. There's Hans Van Klinken in there, not tying the clink hammer, which I really liked as well. Um, it was the <laughs> Caddis uh, nymph as well. And I, because that would be an easy tap in, wouldn't it, to, to do that. And I really like that you've gone a, a different way with that as well. But there are many um, fly ties in there who are on top of their game who are giving some really interesting hints and tips. And I'm assuming on the basis of our conversation so far, you've illustrated a lot of that because it's beautifully illustrated and complemented with photographs as well. But did you do that illustration work to go with them as well? I did all the illustration wow. work. The thing, with, the thing with an illustration is like when I was growing up, I was reading people like Shrebert and Dave Whitlock and John Betts and and all of these guys, and uh, what's, it, what's the other guy's name? Man? Oh, I can't forget him. He's so good. Um, John McKinn. You know, and, and the pictures made so much sense to me when I saw these little graphic drawings of the things. They, you kind of, it's almost as if a drawing is a little bit more clearer than a photograph. You can see what's going on because you can manipulate a drawing more than you can a photograph. Like, well, personally, that's that's what I think. So, so drawings really help you to see things. You know, like simple things, like thread control. You know, a lot of people don't don't understand that. That so you've got a your fly tying thread. It consists of many fibers. But while you're working with a thread, that thread is busy moving and doing things while you're working with it, and that affects the final outcome of the fly. And most people don't know that. When you are wrapping thread, it's twisting up. You know, it's, you're putting twists. If you so so bulk building up. If you do not every now and then, just untwist your thread and get it coming in flat. Good tires do this automatically. You know, but very often when you when you're teaching someone, you you'll look at a video on YouTube and you'll you'll see his beautiful fly and you're tired and you go, why doesn't mine look like that? I followed the video. You know, because he's doing things that he's not telling you he's doing. And those are those tiny little details that make a massive difference. Same thing with fishing. Go fish with a go fish with a, a world champion fly fisherman. And then and, and and I know it's not about like we said, it's not about numbers. But numbers do tell us a story. If one guy is catching thirty fish for every one I'm catching, why? What's the difference? Where, you know, what is he doing differently to me? And then you talk to these guys, and it's if you look at them fish, they're not doing anything magical or or casting like a total champion and making these arrow type loops. And most of them are quite ordinary looking as well, but they they're tapping into the small details, the small nuances, like maybe using a tip it with a thinner diameter to get the fly down quicker and get it in the zone for longer. Or, you know, there's these tiny little tricks that they do. And and then they start explaining that to you. And you go, ah, oh, okay, that's cool. That's cool. And you you pick that up. So there's, there's so, and the same thing with fly time. There's so many small, cool little things. People say, don't, don't sweat the small stuff. You should sweat the small stuff. It makes a hell of a difference, you know. My next question was going to be, what would you hope the reader get from that? And do you want to tell us from, from reading it? Well, all I want the reader to do is to basically be inspired 
to think beyond what they normally think about. If you look at the whole way the world works, traditionally people are followers. We like following. We, we are sheep. Let's face it, that's how we roll. But what I want to say is, you don't have to just graze in your same pasture every day with your same flock of sheep. You're allowed to go beyond the confines of that and experience that. And maybe that'll just be cool. Why not? And so, so this book is basically designed to get you thinking and get you working outside of your comfort zone. You know, I mean, if everyone wants to think that they're great or brilliant at something, so you'll get a guy on Facebook who will tie just parachutes, and he's really good at parachutes. But if you had to tie, ask him to tie anything else, he'd probably battle because he's stuck in one thing. And people want to think that they're good. Like I tell my children, you don't have to be good at something to enjoy it. You know, my kids want to overachieve at everything they do. So my son, when he plays rugby, wants to be the best. He wants to make it in the provincial team. He wants to this, he wants to that. I said to him, why not go play chess? You love chess. He says, because they'll kill me at chess. I said, you don't have to win every game to enjoy it. We, we tend to think we have to be good at everything. We don't. So do things that challenge you, that, that basically take you out of your comfort zone, that it doesn't matter if you tie a crap fly. I mean, what's the worst? You just cut it up and go again. Like, we overthink these things. We, I, I don't know if it's, it's got to do with ego or what, but I've realized, like, I've tied a lot of shit flies. Lots. Plenty of shit flies. I've spent, like, eight hours on a classic salmon fly to realize that the tail was three millimeters too short. And no matter how hard I carried on, the fly would never be what I wanted it to be. So I took a blade to it and I shaved it right down. And I started again. And then I tied the fly I wanted to tie. And it all worked. You know, flies are like dominoes. Um, look at something like a traditional cat skill. If you tie the, the tail too short, there will be too much weight up front and the fly will topple in the drift. So, so, so basically, if you don't tie the tail the right length, then it doesn't matter what you do after that, the fly will be ineffective because you've set this domino off and it's just toppling these other dominoes off. So, so yeah, so, so I enjoy doing things that, that I'm not comfortable with. Like, like during COVID, I was tying beast flies. I mean, I don't even salt or fly fish. But I'd, I'd read this book by, um, what's his name? Uh, it's the beast fly guy, man. I can't, I was hit on the rock, with, on the head of the rock the other day. And ever since then, I'm forgetting things. I oh, know, I'm Bob Popovich. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. I read this book and I was like, this guy's a genius. And I was tying his beast flies. And I thought, this is pretty cool. And like bucktail is not something I really work with, but I, I started understanding bucktail. Bucktail is a cackle. I mean, not all bucktail is equal. One bucktail is just easier to work with than the next, and you need different hair for different applications, and you know different textures, different qualities, different. And and you only discover that stuff properly if you play with it, if you you know um, experiment and play. And like the first like. I tied were crap. They were horrible. But at some stage, I started understanding them. I'm like, ah, oh, is that how it works? Okay. Because I'd, I'd tie the fly and, and try and let it look like it would in its final format. And I realized, no, with bucktail, that's, you don't need to do that. The fly looks totally different. I put it in water and I shape it. And then it, I get that lovely profile. The finished fly, once I've tied it, looks rubbish. But what I do to it afterwards gets me the shape. And then and I thought to myself, okay, this is pretty cool. And I thought, where else can I apply this? And I started applying it for things like, uh, like when I was tying killer patterns, like Mrs. Simpsons and Walker's Killers. I'd like, okay, I can get the water to reshape the feathers for me to, to give the fly a specific shape. I was like, oh, that's great. Because if you wet something and you let it dry, 
that drives in the shape you, you know, that's something I actually also, I've, I've always known that from classic salmon tying. You know, we do that all the time. We reshape feathers. Um, so that's another thing. Like people say, like, why do you tie classics? Like, what's the point? There's no salmon in Africa. I'm like, I enjoy doing it. It's just cool. And I've learned a lot doing it that I, that I can apply to other things too, you know. So, so you don't have to be good at stuff to like it or to get something out of it. Um, life's not about success. You know, we've got this idea that if we're successful, we're going to be happy. That's actually not true. I know a lot of sad millionaires. I do. I also know a lot of sad, broke people. Make no mistake, money does make life easier. But success isn't the only thing. You know, there's something else there. So, yeah, try things. Yeah, I like that. And I think my take out from talking with you today, and I was just writing it down there, was that it's good to question things. And I think as anglers, uh, and we've talked about how society is now, and like you say, I think, and it, I worry, too many people worry about their life being dominated by how many likes they get. And it doesn't matter. Stuff like that just isn't important. But I think that's my take out from talking with you today is it's good to question. And I think that the books as well, um, look at these things as well and talk about them. You certainly talk from the heart today um, and you write from the heart. And there's a lot of soul in the book, um, the, the um, Feather Mechanic books that I think is a lovely testament. And I like that you're coming from a completely different angle. As you say, you can buy a book with a load of recipes and that's great. But the little nuances, what those flies mean, not just to you, because I very much like the ant pattern that you tied um, in the book, but also from all of this um, roster of great fly ties that you've illustrated and spoken to and got all of those little extra things that fit in. It almost it, it's partly your personality is in this book, isn't it? Quite quite strongly, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd say my DNA is in the book. Look, these people, all the people who wrote chapters in this book were were people who who inspired me. Who a, a lot of these people I'd, I'd read about as, as a little kid. Uh, John Roberts, you know John Roberts. He wrote this book called The World's Best Trout Flies in I think it was ninety five or somewhere there. And as a little kid, I had this book, and I read about these things. And a lot of the, the a lot of the ties in this book, I, I got to know through John's book when I was fifteen, you know, where I like kind of, where I, I just emailed him and said, would you like to, you know, write <laughs> write a chapter in a book? And they were like, yeah, fine. The, half of these guys didn't even know who I was. It was so cool. And it wasn't just about getting like popular people to write. Uh, chapters in the book that the one chapter is written by an 18 year old kid named Daniel Daniel's a competitive fly fisherman I met him uh, actually met him at the launch for my first book he was tying there and I just thought what an interesting kid he like just thinks on another level so I said to him Daniel write a chapter for my book he's like what yeah write a chapter just write one you know because fishing appeals to everyone it's not just about you don't have to be some God-given talent to to know something. I mean, some of the coolest stuff I've learned was from people, from students, who show me something, and I was like, "Wow, that's amazing! Can I borrow that?" Yeah, I'll go for it. They didn't even know they they were doing something cool, you know. So yeah, yeah, you can always learn. You never know everything, and know that. And if you know that, you're cool. Yeah, absolutely. Like that very much. Gordon, it's been wonderful talking with you. How can people connect with you? How can they find you on social media um, and learn a little bit more about the book as well? Or the book, sir? Well, uh, yeah. So uh, on Instagram, I'm on, uh, you can just look under The Feather Mechanic and you'll find me there. Also on Facebook. Um, you can email me if you like. I love chatting to people. Gordon. G O R D O N dot Fundespay, V A N D E R S P U Y at gmail.com. 
And yeah, that's basically how you can connect with me. Fantastic. And I can't recommend the book highly enough. Um, I think everyone will get something out of this. As I said, I've not been paid to say that. I'm just saying it because I think it is different. <laughs> so, um, but check will be hopefully in the post garden at some stage from you. Um, but, <laughs> but no, it's, it's genuinely not been the case. I just think it's really interesting what he's doing. It's different. You're getting a sense of the person behind it. So if you've, you've enjoyed listening to this, I think you're going to enjoy the book. If you're in the UK, another shout out, get the book from Paul Morgan at Cocky Bundu Books. Again, I have no connection with him whatsoever, other than being a happy end user as well. But Gordon, it's been wonderful to get a sense of you as a person, as a fly angler and as a fly dresser and as an author as well. Thank you so much for talking with me on the Fly Culture podcast today. Pete, thank you very much. It was cool chatting to you. Everyone, this has been the Fly Culture Podcast. Thank you so much for listening to this edition. I hope you've enjoyed this one. And there'll be plenty more as always. But thank you so much for listening to the Fly Culture Podcast. The Fly Culture Podcast is brought to you in association with Fly Culture, a quarterly print magazine. For more information, please visit flyculturemag.com. You can also find Fly Culture on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter.